Dr. Eddy? I'm Dini. Yeah, hi. Okay, now we are feeling comfortable. <laughs> Can you, uh, is it possible, do you have a video on your uh, computer, Dr. Eddy? Oh, I'm not able to find that. Just on the lower left border, Dr. Reddy, yeah, yeah. next to the next to the mic button, there is a video button. There isn't. That's what I'm surprised. Oh, then the computer does it have a camera? Yeah, yeah. Let me. Oh. Let me open it up again. Okay. I may have to come back. Okay. I'll, I'll come back in one minute. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> Have all of you received our uh, learning points, articles, and the presentation that we had on 13th? Okay. Please let us know. Because okay? if we don't receive it in 24 hours, that means, you know, somehow you have been missed out. Please uh, write back and we let us know. Thanks, Lipika, for the message. Thanks to so many of you. Okay. So your video is working. Video is working. Okay, I'll start introducing you, but we can't see you. You'll have to adjust your laptop so that the camera is on you. Now we can see a wall or something. Yeah. yeah I'm Just, myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me have the pleasure of uh, introducing uh, Dr. Suresh Reddy. Um, not that he requires too much of introduction. He has been uh, visiting India regularly and has been there for every conference for last two decades and uh, been an important faculty during our conferences and workshops. So he's a professor based at um, Houston, Texas. Um, he works as uh, the head of uh, educational activities in the palliative care department at uh, MD Anderson. Houston, um, US. Uh, he also is the chairperson to the uh, Palliative Care Educational Initiatives in India, which runs uh, seven centers with six weeks training programs all across India through a non-governmental organization of oncologists and um, other doctors based in the US of Indian origin, that is Indo-American Cancer Association. So he has been very, very keen on uh, the development of uh, good quality palliative care in India and uh, has contributed tremendously for its uh, growth over the years. Uh, I was looking up uh, Google Scholar for uh, Dr. Reddy and Methadone, how much are they associated with each other and so many articles threw up. So you can be rest assured that you're hearing from someone who knows what he's talking about. Uh, he has done, I mean, in, I have been to MD Anderson and uh, literally 95% um, of the patients in MD Anderson are on methadone. That is the usual analgesic that is used there, the most popular analgesic. So they have been using it for decades and they are very well versed with, um, you know, all the actions and um, um, side effects and managing and titrating and changing over and conversions of methadone. And Dr. Reddy has been very, very active academically in uh, doing research on the topic of um, application of methadone in uh, pain and especially in cancer pain. So we look forward to hearing from you, Dr. Reddy. Thank you very much. Nandini, thank you so much for the introduction. I probably don't deserve that kind of introduction because I'm talking to experts here today. 
Dr. Reddy, little louder or closer to the mic, or if you can use a headphone with a speaker, because you are heard, but it is not clear. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll go a little closer to the mic. How about now? Can you hear now? Is, is everyone okay? Can you just reply in chat whether uh, you're okay? Gayatri says no. You have no choice, Dr. Reddy. If Gayatri says no, it is a big no. So you have to do something about it. My Gayatri always says no. <laughs> you have a mic with a speaker? I mean, headphone with a speaker yeah. or something? I don't yeah, please. Speaker, but I have a mic. A good mic, I hope. Okay. Clear. Gayatri says clear. Okay. Andhra says clear. Okay. Tilt the that computer a little more because we can see your forehead mostly. We would like to see your whole face. Tilt it a little more. Little more. I can see you're sitting in your office, in your uh, office room in MD Anderson. Okay. Now we are good. Okay. All right. I'm yeah. Thank you, you so morning. much. Yeah. Really? Uh, I'm just standing here. That's why I think you're not able to. Uh, like to stand, but again, like I said, no face is not important. So thank you so much, uh, Andini, for your introduction. And I didn't realize that I'm really speaking to experts here. So I was hoping that I will, I'm speaking to students, but you guys are all uh, the same level. The differential is less. I, I come lower. I don't know how this is going to go. So keeping in view of the goals of ECO, where it is mostly case-based discussions. Uh, supported by mostly evidence, uh, but as you know, uh, some of the evidence is not there, it's evolving. So don't expect evidence for every statement I'm going to say, uh, especially for methadone. Methadone evidence is lacking. This is all like uh, every group does they do their own studies, mostly retrospective, and they're not knowing exactly how methadone is going to work in their patients. So. Most of, the, most of them are going to be a retrospective analysis of the data. So whatever we have so far, not solid level one evidence and of data for methadone, because it's, it's, methadone is a funny drug and also it's logistically it's impossible to do concrete studies that you do with other medications. So with that, let's uh, get started. Mostly have all the cases and have uh, put some papers, publications in between but I'm going to concentrate on cases because that's where uh, you're going to see where it is useful and uh, what kind of problems you expect from it. So I just want to allay a lot of fears about methadone. Uh, we have a lot of experience in methadone. I, I must say uh, at the outset that it's a very safe drug. Okay, uh, it, On paper and when you hear about its pharmacokinetics, uh, it seems like it's a risky drug. But really, I've not seen a, a single death that I can directly attribute to methadone in the last 20 years I've used methadone here at MD Anderson. But again, we deal with cancer, and cancer is a complicated disease, and so many things happen. So it's very difficult to pinpoint if methadone causes death. Having said that, uh, in the United States, mostly in non-cancer -can setting, there are a lot of deaths attributed to methadone. Uh, there are uh, about 50,000 more of uh, deaths, a third of them are attributed to methadone every year. So methadone is bad in non-cancer setting, but used right in a cancer pain setting, it's, it's very, very safe. So with that, I would like to start my first case. If, can I change slides from here? I, I, I guess not. We are projecting the slides, right? So, uh, so the object is what today are. How much time I have, Nandini? I have like about 30 minutes. Sure, I think it is about half an hour that we have in mind, but 20, 25 minutes is absolutely great. Okay. Right on. Yeah, I'll try to finish by then. These are the these are the objectives for today's talk. So indication for methadone in different scenarios. And the methadone conversion methods, very important. Uh, can it, and then a little bit about methadone and QTC interval. You already heard uh, in the last talk, I think. Methadone and drug interactions, you heard. 
And the, uh, another thing is conversion from methadone to other opioids. When, when somebody is not doing well on methadone, so what is the evidence and what is the ratio that we use to go from methadone to other opioids? We'll touch briefly on that. Next one. Let's start with the uh, first case where I make a point for using methadone as the first line before even starting any opioid. This is a 46 year old female with history of uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the tongue who had uh, massive surgery and radiation treatment and also had a uh, flap reconstruction. She's having severe left jaw pain with radiation in the left ear and scalp, obviously, as she has a combination of somatic and neuropathic pain. Uh, the question is, can we start methadone directly before we start anything in this patient? There is, a, there is a study done by Brewer in 2004, which does uh, advocate methadone is safe as a first line uh, in, uh, as per this study. So he randomized people to both methadone and uh, morphine arm. He did not find any difference in analgesia between the two groups, meaning methadone is as good as morphine as the first line. And the side effect profile was similar, even though he noted a little more sedation in methadone group uh, than morphine group. But duration four weeks study, methadone as the first line was as good as morphine. So he made a case for methadone as the first line opioid. But I personally will not use methadone as the first line. In fact, I use it as third line, second or third line. Uh, it all depends on how many opioids you have available. So I, I would really pull methadone uh, as a last resort. And sometimes I, I do for different reasons. But uh, the clinical indication, methadone as the first line should be reserved, uh, even though we have, you know, this, this study shows that we can safely use it. Next one. Next slide, please. Yeah, this this show. I mean, I'm not going to details of this study. You're going to get this uh, presentation. But again, uh, same improvement in pain, uh, same uh, side effects. Next slide. So uh, after I made a case for first line methadone, how do you really initiate methadone? You know, you heard from last lecture that you need to be, you need to start very slow, very low dose, and don't change doses frequently. So I would start, if you're using as a first line, really, I will not start uh, more than one to two milligrams twice a day. I will morph in as a breakthrough, uh, five to 10 milligrams every two to four hours as needed. Of course, you'll be adding other adjuvants as per WHO, NSAIDs, but as far as anti-epileptic drugs are concerned or anti-neuropathic drugs are concerned, especially Gomal and anti because there's a potentiation effect of these drugs with, uh, with opioids, I would be slightly careful in adding gabapentin, especially at the doses that we use sometimes. You know, the, the recommendation is to use 300 milligrams three times a day. I will not do that in this situation or with any opioid, especially with methadone. I will start very low, if at all, maybe 100 milligrams at night and gradually increase it every third day. Then wait for at least three days uh, before you increase the dose. Uh, and usually increase the dose not more than 30% on third or fourth day. Uh, we pick third day based on what we do is based on our observation here, which are not published yet. Uh, we have a couple of pharmacists in our team. Uh, and, and anytime we switch, or start somebody on methadone, uh, we kind of call them on telephone. We have a telephone uh, program where they get called every third day. And then uh, we titrate medications depending on you know their uh, report of pain on the telephone. And uh, they notice that you really don't need, you don't, you don't change before three days, number one. And then don't, don't need to use breakthrough medication in between. And the average time they had to increase methadone was two to three max. They never had to do three time increase. So average increase, number of increases that we have seen is three times. That means in, in 10 days time, you just need three day increase. So that's how we do it and it's pretty safe and pain is under decent control with that kind of stuff. Uh, so, but at the same time, be aware of other medications the patient is on and uh, hope you have seen the drug interactions of methadone, and especially the ones which, which I, I'll, I'll show you in my case. So be aware of other medications which are likely to interact with methadone. Next one. So going to the next case. So after finishing the case, making case for first line methadone, which I personally don't use, but I put it because 
there is evidence if you want you can use it uh, then let's go on to see where else can methylon be used so this is a case i have seen in in the, in the beginning days when i was starting to use methadone this is a 51 year old male with a history of advanced cancer of the right lung uh, he was admitted uh, on the floor to go to the hospital and he had neck pain radiate, radiating down the right arm and the ear it was associated with some numbness in the same arm on exam we found a slight weakness and decreased sensation important uh, right finger absence of deep uh, deep tendon reflexes on the right upper extremity we don't go into details but this is what we had, we knew that there was something going on the mri did reveal disease in the cat1 of the not distribution next one so the patient was started not by us by by the other oncologist uh, the fentanyl patch 25 micrograms an hour the morphine 2 milligrams every 2 hours as needed on day 3 of admission uh, we were consulted for worsening of his pain uh, reporting 10 over 10 and the physical examination uh, we, well, i already showed you what we found at this time uh, one thing we noticed was when we touched the patient he was jumping uh, any 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 touch on the skin he was jumping around what i called as a startling reaction and we have seen lot of tetanus cases in india in which you know when the tetanus how they jump similar situation are found so i thought uh, maybe the opioids is causing this hyperalgesia which is a well known phenomena and uh, so we changed to methadone uh, so after methadone uh, this this startling sensation disappeared and pain really improved on day 5 and at that time then we started him on steroids and palliative radiation therapy on day 9 and toward the hospitalization the pain completely resolved i believe it or not so it was one good case i have seen and you know hyperalgesia again i'm not going to spend too much time here and uh, this is a paradoxical reaction of any opioid and usually they say it's dose dependent on, on duration but i have seen it in acute uh, situations too uh, when you give iv opioids it can it can happen and they have this diffuse allodynia even to mild touch uh, they interpret that mild touch as pain and uh, of course as you increase the dose Uh, you uh, increase this phenomena uh, it is known to be caused by activation of this glutamine glutaminergic system which is an excitatory system in the central nervous system and we observe that there is significant reduction in pain from opioid rotation possibly because of nmda receptor uh, antagonism uh, and it, that's why probably it was successfully treated by using methadone next one so uh, so that was hyperalgesia for methadone you can make a case for that if you rarely it's not common but once you see it probably rotating to methadone might be a good option in that situation methadone as a cost and i was talking to sushma about the uh, cost of methadone in india apparently it's like uh, 30 rupees or 10 tablets strip am i right for 5 mg tablet so if you're using 5 mg uh, twice a day Which is equal to almost like a 60 milligrams of morphine. Uh, so it's 30 rupees. Uh, so if you, I don't know if you got, compare to morphine per day of methadone, it's not that cheap. I didn't find it that cheap. So it's pretty similar, uh, I guess. But if you're going at a higher dose, if you're if you're using uh, morphine um, equivalents, daily equivalents of 300 and more, maybe methadone was a lot cheaper than morphine. something to note that higher doses methadone is cheaper at lower doses probably it's comparable to to morphine but i can tell you you don't really need to go higher you know the average dose that useful we found in our patients is the 40 to 50 mg maximum i mean you don't need to go any higher than that in the, in our patients so so this is a, a cost i'm making a case for cost of methadone it's definitely a lot lot cheaper in united states compared to other opioids especially when you use long acting and short acting a lot cheaper so this is a uh, i've seen i've seen this patient in the clinic this is a 35 year old female with history of breast carcinoma with metastasis to sacrum uh, so uh, she came with a low back pain and uh, she was doing really well uh, she was on the morphine long acting 60 twice a day and morphine 10 uh, every 4 hours i mean come i can't afford my morphine anymore at that time possibly morphine uh, long acting was not generic 
So that's why it was expensive. But now I think it becomes generic because it doesn't, the scale doesn't apply. But uh, so she's kind of not taking as prescribed to save the medication because she had to pay out of pocket uh, for this medication. So uh, obviously we had to go to something else. Next one, please. So we started on a methadone a liquid, 7.5 milligrams, uh, along with as needed PRN. It means as needed morphine. Uh, so three days later, she came to clinic and followed in the clinic, and she was uh, pain control was very really good, and no no difference at all. The, uh, as needed morphine was discontinued. In fact, uh, we we introduced methadone as a breakthrough also after that. And, Methadone can be used as breakthrough, but you need to be careful. Uh, after steady state is reached, methadone uh, is, if you're cautious and if you're experienced, methadone is a very good uh, breakthrough medication as well. So if you don't want to change breakthrough uh, different drugs. But generally, it's a methadone and some other opioid for breakthrough. So I would be cautious, and unless you have experience with it, I will not advocate using methadone as breakthrough, uh, but it can be used. Next one. So this is a this is a Mercadante paper. Uh, so he did like uh, over ten year period. What he did in the paralytic unit, he did uh, seventy seven percent of inpatient rotations to methadone, and he said that over ten year period was successful. Median time to achieve dose stabilization was three days. That's a little less, I thought. Median number of doses dose changes are three point two, which is which is the kind of experience we have too. A little less for us. Uh, so median number of days admitted after opioid rotation was six days, and uh, you know the using initial fixed ratio followed by titration effective and safe. So basically, what he's doing is doing fixed ratio, which will come to that uh, momentarily, and then we use the breakthrough. So this was a successful method on rotation. Next one. So that was for the cost, and uh, I don't know how to make make a case for neuropathic pain. Uh, how why methadone is useful, and this is a case I've seen, which you are likely to see in India also. A 50 year old female with a metastatic breast carcinoma, with low back pain, has metastasis in the lumbar spine. Now she has epidural disease and pain radiating on the left lower extremity, L5S1 region. Uh, so she was treated with conventional, you know, bisphosphonates monthly, chemotherapy radiation, radiation therapy done, exercise radiation, uh, but pain is persistent. She's already on adjoint medications. Next one. And you say gabapentin. Then initially we start with morphine, uh, 10 milligrams every four hours. But pain really there for three days, despite this. But she also started developing constipation with morphine now. And we slowly introduce sustained release morphine, 30 milligrams every four hours. And then patient develops nausea now. So metoclopamide was started. We added the Senna and, and the polyethylene glycol, which is the powder, lactate, which is which are very commonly used here. Uh, we, we use that. The pain still persisted, and the, the dose was escalated very rapidly after this. The pain was severe, uh, almost 200 percent the next week. Then she came to emergency room. Obviously, you expect the rapid escalation of morphine with M6G and M3G, and uh, she brought to emergency room with confusion. Because so all the excitatory side effects that you see from uh, morphine and metabolite, and that obviously constipated, pain still an issue. In this case, I probably would uh, go to methadone because she has combination pain, somatic and neuropathic also. She's already starting to develop what you call an opioid induced neurotoxicity, which is mostly an excitatory phenomenon. So, if you really have to calculate methadone, how do you do it? Uh, methadone, she was on 200 in 24 hours. So use a factor of 10. I'll show you how to use the factor. Ten, methadone is 10 times more potent as we told. So it comes to 20 milligrams. And you really, once you go from morphine to methadone, after converting, you have to reduce by 30 to 50 percent to account for cross tolerance. There's a phenomenon called incomplete cross tolerance. That means when you go from low potency to high potency, okay, you have to use a lot less dose. And there is a big phenomena. Probably we'll talk next time for lack of time. I cannot go into details, but really she needs only 10 milligrams of methadone, which is 5 milligrams by the day. I just want to put this to show that you know you you really 
can dose every 12 hours. Some people dose every six hours, four hours, eight hours, it's all over the place. And I rarely do, uh, when I start somebody on methadone, I rarely go less than 12 hours. So every 12 hours is what we need to dose to keep it in, 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 in that range. Even though serum level really does not correspond to, to analgesia. Something to keep in mind. It is different for every patient. And uh, some patients may be a lot lower uh, than that. And uh, they may need, in fact, once a day. Uh, but generally what we have seen is the need, to, if you to use every 12 hours, that's, that's good enough. Occasionally I go every eight hours. If they report to me that I have to take a lot, I have to take a lot of breakthrough medication at eighth hour, ninth hour, tenth hour, then occasionally I may do eight hours. But generally uh, every eight hour, 12 hours will do. So that was the case for neuropathic. And we will go and look at the evidence really that is there any, these are all cases by the way. Uh, remember, these are all cases. These are not like a randomized controlled trials, but case reports based on the clinical bedside experience. So methadone and QDC, which we talked with a lot of on is with methadone. And methadone does cause QDC prolongation. You, I don't know if this was explained last time, but it does inhibit, uh, I don't know if you remember the action potential, cardiac action potential. In the potassium rectified channel in the phase three and four of cardiac cycle. Uh, so it prolongs QT because it inhibits those slow rectifier potassium channel, which is the uh, HERG uh, gene that, that, that's what synthesizes that channel. So if you inhib methadone inhibits that, and there are a lot of drugs which inhibit that. When you inhibit that, the action potential is prolonged, so your QTC period is prolonged, and uh, methadone does that. The how fast it does, I mean, it's like any other drug, it gets absorbed and it goes there quickly. So that's why when you talk about when do you do EKG, it's a very controversial uh, topic. Uh, so, so uh, this is a 70, just, just to highlight on QTC interval, this is a 72 year old male. He has a diagnosis of metastatic lung carcinoma with a bone and liver mass. And uh, after developing opioid induced neurotoxicity, like excitatory side effects, hallucination, myoclonus. He was switched to methadone 10 milligrams every 12 hours with a morphine 50 milligram. And patient has a long history of anxiety on uh, diazepam 5 milligrams per day. He also has a history of angina, table on nitro as needed. Okay, Patient reporting restlessness at night and the haloperidol was prescribed on top of benzodiazepine 2 milligram at night. In three days, he developed chest pain. Uh, this time is not relieved by nitroglycerin. Uh, just a routine EKG, ECG was done. Uh, sorry, I'm getting, I used to EKG here, but uh, and besides ECG, uh, I was not. So, um, pardon me if I'm using some United States terms here. ECG was done, which was normal, except that QTC interval was prolonged, and that was noted to be 510 milliseconds. That's a little high, okay? And we need to know the normal range for the males and females, the difference. Uh, so, QTC prolonged is reported. Uh, Paul Walker is, is our, our colleague here, and he he, he was the initial uh, physician who reported case series of uh, methadone and, and QTC. Most of the methadone and QTC uh, prolongation come from studies on patients on methadone maintenance. You know, people who are drug addicts and they're on methadone maintenance, they're usually on a very high dose, not like uh, they need in cancer pain. So, very little. so the 300 milligrams per day of methadone, which Nobody uses these days, and that's when he found uh, ventricular arrhythmias uh, and torso uh, deformities and bradycardia. But bradycardia can certainly occur. Bradycardia can certainly occur. You need to be aware of that. Next one, please. And we did a study. We followed 100 patients prospectively. Uh, we measured QTC at two weeks and four weeks. Uh, so, if more than 430 milliseconds in males and more than 415 in females is considered in increase. That's when the risk goes up. Uh, so, but we did not find significant changes here. Only one patient had more than 500. And clearly, we did not, uh, nobody died. And we continued methadone in most cases, including the one on 500, which eventually got to baseline. So, it is quite safe. It does happen. Does it happen only at higher doses? No. It, it can happen at lower doses. Uh, so, what do you do? I think it all risk versus benefit, right? If, uh, uh, if you are using with other drugs which are likely to cause and other risk factors are there, uh, like older people and electrolyte imbalances are there. So 
So you need to be cautious. And then maybe if the cost permits, maybe a baseline uh, EKG uh, followed by another EKG later if you're increasing the dose. But for uh, cancer patients with limited prognosis, probably not warranted. Uh, it's not worth it uh, because we have not seen this like, you know, the methadone maintenance is like a very high dose people. So it's very common in those group, but in the cancer patients, hopefully you'll not go more than 30, 40 milligrams a day. Uh, it's not common. So next one. So these are the ECG guidelines for methadone. Uh, these are only guidelines available in the Canadian guidelines also, uh, but pretty similar. Uh, so this this is what they advocate. Very controversial. So EKG do before starting the dose and 30 days after and annually. That seems a little 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 bit delayed for me. I mean, if you really have to do EKG, do EKG now and maybe after six days, really after a future steady state. Uh, so nobody knows though, you know, how quickly it, it causes that. You know, then if the more than 500, certainly I would be very cautious. I will not use methadone. If there is more than 500. If you are planning to use methadone in a non cancer situation where they are likely to stay on methadone for long, unlike cancer patients, then I would certainly get a baseline EKG on these patients. If you, if you know. But again, I advocate not to use methadone in non cancer situation because of the problems we have seen. You need to be very cautious about that. But that's when you probably are warranted to do EKG. Otherwise, in a cancer patient, really, uh, not, it's not cost effective. So these are the guidelines though, you know, because the two panelists, if you see the last bullet point, we drew from this recommendation because they thought this was too much, you know. Of course, as a cardiologist, you have to be cautious and all that, but what is the risk versus benefit in, in, in this patient? So, so that's about EKG and you decide, you know, uh, when to do EKG, but uh, I will tell you it's pretty safe. But you need to be aware of that. And this risk goes up, especially when you use with uh, other drugs which are likely to interact and raise methadone blood levels, that's when you may see a problem. So if you initiate somebody on a benzodiazepine or things like that, then you need to be cautious. Next one. So that's our EKG and methadone. Next one. So this is important. How do you convert? How do you, if somebody on morphine, you know, I hope you still use morphine before you use methadone. So let's look at the ways how you convert if somebody is on morphine already and they're not doing well and you want to start using methadone. Hopefully this is a very common situation for India. Uh, so this is what we are going to do. So 50 year old man, I did it to hospital with severe back pain, secondary to bone mass, it's fine. Uh, he had to be admitted and start on morphine infusion, initially two milligrams an hour, with five milligrams every two hours. So uh, we kept increasing the doses uh, so then, uh, as expected, he started developing drowsiness, restlessness, twitching, and now hallucinations. All the opioid induced neurotoxicity we talked already. And the patient also reporting, the wife reporting confusion at times. So we made a decision to convert him to methadone. Uh, final dose of morphine was 10 milligrams an hour. And he is needing about six doses, 10 milligrams of IV. It's all IV, by the way, uh, in 24 hours. That's when we decided to switch him to methadone. So I have a question from Jennifer, so somebody will come to that. Convert to methadone, what method you are going to use? There are many, many methods to describe. Some are dangerous, and some are ultra conservative, and some are like uh, uh, borderline of being dangerous. Okay? So just to recapitulate how the conversion started on methadone and what kind of uh, guidance we got is probably the first one where uh, Rico Monte in Italy uh, did this study switching from morphine to oral methadone in treating cancer pain? What is the equinergic dose ratio? So let's look at that. Next one, please. So, this was a morphine before the switch, and daily methadone dose was 24, 21 milligrams after the switch. The median time of three days, like you expect, was necessary to achieve this, probably a little longer, in my opinion. Uh, so what they found is the lower the pre-switching morphine dose, the fewer days necessary, and probably you need a lower dose of methadone also. That's what they found, okay? So those ratios range from 2.5 to 1 to 14 to 1. So this is way, 
wide range really so you can say five so, so they if this they they if they divide the table next one this is a table they divide uh, the table you see very frequently so it depends the methadone conversion ratio depends on the morphine they are on previously so this is the dose range on the left hand side that less than 30 1 to 2 ratio is used 30 and 94 to 1 uh, so so on and so forth so it goes to more than 1020 to 1. i would caution though about extreme extremes both at the low level and the high level for example if somebody's on 30 milligrams of morphine you're not going to use like uh, 15 milligrams of methadone no one to two that's too, way too high in my opinion okay similarly at a very high dose if somebody's at a thousand milligrams of uh, morphine you're not going to use 50 milligrams of methadone they they were too high especially the fact that as a morphine dose keeps going up the, the need for methadone dose keeps coming down that's why it's slowly increasing the ratio is increasing and uh, in one of the studies uh, that compared direct switch to three-day switch uh, they did use uh, high, high dose conversion and that's why i think they ended up uh, in, in, in problem uh, we'll talk about that momentarily next one so there are several methods these are the two methods we follow actually and they are equally good even though the, the three-day switch so according to some papers, it's better than clean switch. What we call as just stop the previous morphine completely when you decide to go to methadone and start on methadone and then gradually increase that's needed every third or fourth. Next one. So let's look at clean switch. So first step is determine the daily dose of morphine. In our case, about 300 milligrams when you add the breakthrough medication. Comes to 900 milligrams. Okay, next one. And times three, sorry, 300 times three is 900 oral morphine. Then use MEDD to methadone chart to determine daily dose of methadone. Next one. Next one. So the, the, I mean, I'm just showing. You, know, you can, you know, I'm just showing how you can go If it is more 900, is using 15 to one ratio, right? 15 to one ratio. If you do look at this chart, next one. So 15 ratio, it comes to 60 milligrams approximately, 60 milligrams per day. And remember, you cut down by another 30 to 50 percent uh, to, to be conservative. So they reduce by 30 percent of incomplete cross tolerance. That comes to almost 42 milligrams a day of methadone. Next one. So are you going to start? Somebody on 21 or 20 milligrams of methadone every 12 hours. I would be careful. 20 milligrams twice a day is a little much, no matter how much morphine they're on before. This is where a lot of studies falter, in my opinion. You know, they strictly look at the table and converted previous morphine based on the table and come to this. So 20 milligrams every 12 hours on day one and stopping morphine is risky, in my opinion. So you always have to have a safety valve. How much you are going to you are willing to go to top dose? I will not go more than 10 milligrams twice a day, no matter what the dose is. Okay. It seems like you're underdosing. I'd rather be cautious and utilize breakthrough doses liberally while you are titrating methadone. So that's what we do. If you really kick me, I may use 15 milligrams twice a day at the most. Never had to, but usually I restrict myself to 10 milligrams twice a day, not more than that, no matter what the dose is. This is very, very important point to remember. Okay. Next. Let's look at a three-day conversion of the same. The three-day conversion involves reducing 30% of morphine dose every day while you increase methadone by 30%. So that's a three-day, almost 90-90, right? So let's look at day one, how we're going to do. Usually, you know, I, I'm showing you the case. We did one on uh, started on Wednesday. So morphine infusion was reduced to 6.5 from 10, right? So I did 30, approximately 30%, 6.5 an hour. We started methadone, seven milligrams every 12 hours, 30%. And then come to day two, Thursday, morphine infusion was reduced to three milligrams an hour, while methadone uh, was increased to 14 milligrams every four hours. Day three, Friday, where everybody want, wanting to go home, 
running around here. Uh, morphine discontinued, and then methadone, another 40 milligrams added, 20 of approximately 20 milligrams every 12 hours. Next one. So that was a three-day conversion, okay? And uh, this paper highlighted why three-day conversion is safer than stop and go, what we call clean switch. It is also called SAG stop and go. So basically, this is a study that did uh, converting uh, patients from morphine and oxycodone to methadone. They ran up randomized to stop and go, method one, and then three-day switch. And uh, as you see, the pre-switch morphine equivalent daily dose was 900 milligrams in the in the stop and go group and 13 30 milligrams in three days switch group and the stop and go group reported a trend for higher pain intensity on day three and the uh, sa group uh, had more dropouts and three serious adverse events including two deaths uh, so a three days switch is recommended for higher immunity they looked at the pain pain intensity on day three it's important what you're looking at if you're chasing pain, then you're really giving higher dose, okay? But that's not the point here. That's where this paper falters, in my opinion. They use big doses, uh, especially on stop and go. If they're on 900, they use 90 milligrams a day. This is huge, huge dose. And of course, they were uh, advanced cancer patients. They could have died from, died from something else. But I won't be surprised if they died from methadone because if you use 90, 90 milligrams and 120 milligrams a day, uh, you're going to hit a problem. So even though you say three days which is safe or safer, but I'll, I'll show you why three days which is dangerous. Next one. So day four in our patient, where we did three day conversion, day four he was discharged home and he was a little drowsy, was prescribed, uh, you know, the methadone. And day four Sunday, he started becoming mildly restless and became anxious. And day five on Monday, he ended up in emergency room with agitation and confusion. So next one, please. So what? Why is why why three days conversion is dangerous in my opinion? Because we're not perfect. The communication can lapse from from a weekday, uh, you know, staff to weekend staff, and staff may change. You know, you, you do not really your your job is to convert them every day as planned already. It's already planned for you. Three days is already planned for you. So if, if there is a chance that the three physicians may change hands here. Okay. So that's where it, 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 it kind of incorporates error. So you need to be careful on that. Morphine reduction sometimes may not happen. People forget to turn off morphine and both things are going at the same time. Actually, problems happen on fifth or sixth day when the patient is at home. That's when you need to be careful. That's when you need to be making a phone call when you do this three-day conversion. So three days kind of uh, makes you happy. The three days you know, is looking good, but really problems happen later on. And then addition of new medication in the meanwhile, by some other service, without your knowledge, just before the discharge, they also have interacted with methadone causing this problem. So in my opinion, as long as you use that safety valve, like I was telling you, 10 or 12.5 milligrams twice a day, max those safety valve, and then you know stop morphine completely, I can guarantee you they don't go into withdrawal because methadone is very powerful medication. And you use a lot of breakthrough medication. That's what I, I practice now. So clean, stop and go with a safety valve and monitor them closely is what I do. And three day also is fine if, you're, if you feel uncomfortable. Uh, but okay, there's, there's a new paper showing that there's no difference between stop and go and three day conversion. Next one. Please. So this is this shows that you know you at least need three days because to be steady state, uh, you, you need you need three days. Uh, before you change the dose. And in fact, you can make an argument that it can be done four or fifth day, but I would at least wait for three days uh, before I change it based on this next one. And by the way, I bought, I borrowed that slide from uh, Professor Hardy from Australia when she gave a talk in, in, in India. I like some of the slides, so she she sent me this. So I bought some of the slides. So this, this belongs, I have to give credit to her for it. Thank you. Next one. So basically what we are saying is any method can be safe and effective, but you have to have regular assessments when you're starting methadone. Preferably call them or bring them back to clinic uh, if they can come to clinic, at least have some communication with them. You really need to know what you're doing, how you're converting from morphine to methadone. And you really need to know caveats in the table. Don't literally convert. It's not a mathematical game, okay? 
Just look at the table. Let me look at the previous morphine dose and use 15 factor and then convert to methadone. Let me put on this. Not that. There are so many other factors go into it. So that's why you need to be careful. And the other thing is the higher the morphine dose, the less methadone you need. That you need to remember. Okay, it's not totally proportional. Okay, next one. And this is a retrospective analysis we did. Again, we did the same thing. Uh, we did uh, opioid rotation, OR is opioid rotation, and we mostly for uncontrolled pain and side effects. And uh, we had a very good success with methadone. 80% success in opioid rotation to methadone. Again, this is a retrospective study, and this is a series, it's not a randomized trial, but uh, clinical experience shows that this is pretty safe and very good for opioid rotation. Next one. So any questions so far? Are you able to hear me? Any any issues? If we take a gap here at all. Yeah. And then you can hear, everybody can hear? Uh, I can hear very well. And uh, since the you know topic of initiation of methadone is over and uh, conversion is over, uh, if the tips can stop sharing and have the students ask some, I mean, the folks ask questions and then we can proceed, that is also a good idea. Either, either way, yeah. yeah. So, so of all the things that he talked to us about, please uh, raise hands and we could uh, call on you. Who has the first question to ask? No one seems to have a question right now. Ah, yeah, John has a question. Please, John, unmute yourself. Just to get the question started, uh, Dr. Reddy, the, we, it's discussed sometimes that uh, methadone can have, uh, uh, can cause less constipation than some other opioids. I wonder if in your experience you found that to be a predictably meaningful difference or an occasional difference or you never know from one patient to another difference. How have you found that in your experience, please? Okay, sure. So methadone is not any less constipating than other opioids, number one. Number two, though, if you strong on high dose morphine to methadone, because you have to use a lot less dose, what we have seen is patients end up with diarrhea. They've got withdrawal and uh, they have diarrhea for one or two days, which is a good thing also because they've been constipated previously. Once we switch to methadone, the constipation is pretty much gone. But that does not mean that methadone causes less constipation than more. Dr. Reddy, Dr. Reddy, we didn't understand um, that a uh, little bit of disturbance was there. So why is there diarrhea for two days? Can you just please repeat that? What happens is you're using high, especially in a high dose situation, the morphine dose and the hours is north of 300 milligrams and sometimes 500 milligrams. And you're suddenly switching to very high potency opioid. You need almost like a 10th or 20th of what you need with morphine. Suddenly you see that the gut receptors, the receptors in, in the, 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 the small gut and the colon, suddenly they are leached out of morphine. So it, it creates a kind of withdrawal locally in the gut. And that causes you know, uh, gut to gush, gush all the stool. So you see that you know, all the stool and the liquid, everything comes out. They will have a good uh, few ball movements. And to the point of you know, creating diarrhea. So that's what we have seen in the when you switch, but methadone per se, is it less constipating than morphine? I don't think so. It's an opioid. Uh, it's used, I mean, obviously, you are used for, for more than one week or 10 days, and you know, it's the opioid receptors are there in the, in the gut, you know, the same thing. There. Okay, and there are some questions on the uh, chat. Uh, let me just read it out. Yeah. Lipika has to ask this question How to monitor QT prolongation in a hospice setting? Is it routine, um, as a routine? I will not recommend 
you know, uh, QTC monitoring in hospital setting because the risk versus benefit do not, uh, you know, advocate EKG monitoring in hospital setting. Hopefully, by the time they go to hospitals, generally here the prognosis is six months or less, especially in a cancer patient. Okay, so is it really worth monitoring EKG? It depends. Okay, if you're using a very high dose, maybe, and if your patient is likely to live longer. Maybe it's worthwhile doing at least one EKG just to make sure that you know QTC is not prolonged. But generally, no, really, because it, it, it starts more alarms than they cause any benefits here. So I would be cautious in starting EKG monitoring and all that. I mean, if you really argue that, then you should also be monitoring electrolytes, right? Not just EKG, all the risk factors. Are you willing to do that in a hospital patient? It's, it depends. Depends on local expertise, local resources, and what is the goal of the, of doing uh, of, of this. So it depends. You have to define your goal why you are doing that. So, so there are so many factors that go into it. It's not simple like just doing EKG and then what, right? Then what? If it comes 450, are you going to stop it? If it comes 470, are you going to stop it? If it comes 490, are you going to stop it? If it comes 500, are you going to stop it? And how are you going to monitor pain after that? So. It, it raises, in my opinion, it, it raises more questions than 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 they try to offer any benefit. So you need to do it very cautiously. It's, it's almost like any any uh, lab work, right? If you do it just vaguely without any goal, then you know you don't know what to do with it, and it creates more problems and brings more questions from patients and family and the team members. So I would be cautious. So when would you choose to do it, Doctor Reddy? In which okay. patients, not non hospice, but uh, in which patients uh, in palliative care? So if you are, if you are, okay, at, at the initiation of methadone, the recommendation is if the older patient, you know, if they are cancer patient getting chemotherapy, they have fluctuating electrolyte situation, looking at the electrolyte, they are actively treated for cancer, they are getting treatment. So in that situation, it may not be a bad idea to get baseline EKG. Okay. And also depending on the dose you are needing, I may or may not repeat it. I may repeat it in, you know, in a two weeks time and that's it basically. So that's when I do it. But again, the goal here is patient is getting treatment, uh, not an hospice patient. And prognosis can be a year or two years. And then patient has some risk factors, you know, old age, females have higher risk factor, uh, hypokalemia, and what are the medications they're on, you know, they're on some of the immunotherapy drugs have potential to interact with methadone. And uh, if somebody is on already some antipsychotics and benzodiazepines, then I probably consider all this and before I do the AKG. But routinely, no. I, I really I don't order EKG on people who may convert to methadone. Rarely I order in my practice. Very rare. Dr. Megha wants to know the conversion of intravenous to oral methadone. Okay, that's a good question. Since uh, intravenous methadone is not available in India, uh, I, I stayed away from that. But if you have, I, I hope it covered last time, the absorption of methadone is in some patients almost 90%, 80 to 90% absorption. So you really don't have to convert from IV to oral. In fact, I take it as a one to one ratio. If somebody is requiring 20 milligrams of IV methadone, some people would like to say that they need double of that, one to two, okay? But I don't because the absorption is good when oral, same oral medication dose is required. If somebody is on 10 milligrams of IV methadone per day, IV, then they need five milligrams twice a day of oral methadone. It depends, a lot of people don't feel comfortable with that. They think that, you know, liver eats up methadone, it doesn't really. So it depends on your comfort level. Some people go in between, not one to two, some people go 1 to 1.5. So it depends on your comfort level, but you don't really need to uh, increase the dose of oral methadone when you convert from IV to oral. Yeah. And I've, I've done it many times. Both ways is fine. Dr. Reddy, there's a, you know, what we've been hearing uh, is uh, the time to change the, you know, the dose to uh, the titration time five to seven days not earlier than that and you have told us it is like three days is all right so how yeah. should we take it in uh, india like you know three days when do we be more cautious towards five to seven and when can we you know happily say oh this is not getting uh, 
you know relief and let us do it on the third or fourth day itself so i'll tell you based on our experience okay we have called hundreds of patients on our telephone program we have a special methadone telephone program uh, meaning every time we we start somebody on methadone convert to methadone Uh, that name is registered, and the, our pharmacist makes sure they call the patients on third day. And uh, I talked to them yesterday about their experience and all that. They were telling me that you definitely need to call them every every third day, and that's when we change. When in, if the pain is not controlled by third day, we increase by thirty percent. So third day and sixth day is all they they, they said they need. Occasionally they had to do on ninth day, but I think every three days is fine. Okay. As long as you're not going gung ho and increase doubling the dose, uh, but every third day I think is good enough. Yeah. I think it's, it's it's extremely being cautious. Five to six days is too cautious, in my opinion. If you look at pharmacokinetics, there is there is a tendency to do that, but really practically we have we have good experience. Every third day is pretty safe. Yeah, like what we were told in the earlier class was, twenty-two hours is the average half-life, and five times that is uh, five to seven days. So that is uh, the recommended one. So, uh, I mean, if you really go by pharmacokinetic, yes. But if you start practicing at bedside and follow the patients clinically and and ask them about pain and all that, this is what this is what we are getting. So we will just based on some some of our experience, and we are not published this yet, but we will publish this at some stage. Because we have a very close system, and when we call patients, that's what I'm. That's the experience I'm. I'm telling. Doctor Navin, you have mentioned uh, Equimeth two trial. Could you just say what it means? I didn't understand that uh, chat point. Navin, please unmute yourself. I think uh, it just echoes whatever Doctor Reddy was talking. There, there is uh, two trials. One is uh, Equimeth. One and equivalent two, where they have compared the various titration schedules, yes. and they found that uh, three days strategy is the most safe one. Then there is an other systematic review, which has compared seven to eight uh, kinds of uh, uh, methadone uh, conversion and titration by Sarah McLean, and uh, they found that the three day strategy has got ninety three percent success rate. With refer with reference to adverse effects and uh, reference to safety, so uh, I just just wanted to uh, validate whatever Dr. Reddy was saying. That was most valuable, Naveen. I would request uh, Gayatri to just say again. I didn't understand exactly what you written. With three D S, is the increase in dose after five to seven days thirty percent? Can you please uh, clarify the question or? I didn't understand what is 3D S. Nandini, uh, yeah, yeah. the question is: We convert from morphine to methadone by the 3D S uh, method, and okay, now we have reached a level, and after that, pain is still not better. So I want to increase for the the dose of methadone. Your voice is picking up. This pain is still there, persisting. So how do I go about it? So is it 30 percent? Yeah, thirty percent. Don't go more than thirty percent every time, and don't don't increase less than three days. I think uh, that's great uh, discussion, uh, Doctor Reddy. Um, we can go back to your uh, presentation for few, you know, some more slides on drug interactions. Uh, those That's tips. Okay. Can you just please share the presentation again so that Doctor Reddy can complete his talk? So let's go to the drug interaction, and again, this is a very uh, well talked about in the literature, and we have seen cases also uh, from it. Uh, so this is a case again. This is a 56-year-old female uh, with a refractory cervical carcinoma, the advanced disease at the age of 30 years old, with abdominal pain, pneumonia, and uh, urinary tract infection, with mild delirium at this time. It's a common case. I'm not. We're going to see this in India. Patient was recently switched from morphine to methadone, 10 milligrams twice a day along with morphine. Uh, you see the dose 15 every four hours with IV as a backup if overall did not control it, 5 milligrams. Patient was good 
you know, she was walking around and that, but has a history of anxiety, which increases at night. Uh, so she also has a chronic insomnia, she's unable to sleep for many years. Next one. Next slide. So the patient was on antibiotics, amoxicillin. Uh, so she was planned to be discharged to community hospital the next day. No priority day, you know. So patient complained of a severe anxiety and panic episode the night before discharge. She was given two milligrams of haloperidol, followed by three milligrams of lorazepam, which is a benzodiazepine that we use here. Uh, when nurse went to take her vitals in two hours, so she was found unresponsive with no pulse. Patient was do not resuscitate, and he was not resuscitated. Uh, she was pronounced dead at this time. So this is a scenario, and this is a true case. Uh, so next one, please. So what could be the uh, uh, cause? Actually, uh, pardon my typo here. What is the, what could be the cause of a sudden death? One can argue that you know uh, we need to be careful here. So you use haloperidol here, which may again prolong QT interval. And then benzodiazepine, lorazepam, there are three benzodiazepines which are commonly used. I think in India I've seen midazolam being used commonly, and diazepam. And midazolam and diazepam inhibit cytochrome system. And, uh, hopefully the last, last time you learned cyto cytochrome system, the ones which inhibit cytochrome system will increase the level of methadone in the blood suddenly. So if you're using midazolam or diazepam, along with the methadone, and uh, that's when problems start. Lorazepam, on the other hand, that we use here, is conjugated in the liver. It's not that to accept that. Uh, so, uh, because I put the lorazepam here, because you, you use midazolam there commonly, I've seen, and of course, diazepam. So when you introduce that, uh, thinking that it's a benign drug, when somebody's on methadone, and things can happen. And we suspect, I mean, anything could have happened in, the, in this case, and the, all the team was shocked when they came next day to find out that she's already gone. So we kind of discussed this and presented and, uh, you know, differential diagnosis and all that um, could have been, you know, she had infection. So anything could have happened. She could have got PE. When she died, we did not do postmortem uh, because she was, you know, end stage and uh, did not resuscitate. But we are suspecting probably, probably, I, we don't know, probably they got drug interaction in this case, not just simple QT prolongation. Could she have gone into ventricular tachycardia and torsor defaulted and then died uh, and things like that. So just want to bring this dramatic case. I mean, these things won't happen commonly, but if you're not uh, aware of the drug interactions, uh, which group of drugs are interacting with cytochrome system, how methadone is metabolized, what is what cytochrome system is commonly utilized, both inhibitors and inducers, uh, we learned last time what are the group of drugs which can likely do that? Uh, it's very, very important. Especially if you're using this in a non-cancer non situation, also in a cancer situation where patient is not advanced and they're getting treatment, and they need to be aware of this uh, group of medications and, and the interactions with methadone. Next one, please. So basically, you've learned this. Uh, I just do it as the four A's. I call it a three A's, but I added another one. Uh, we call brand name lorazepam and ativan here. Uh, so, amiodarone, antidepressant, antimicrobials, and ativan uh, can do that. But act ativan actually is, a, is conjugated, so I won't worry too much about them unless you use high dose, where combination of lorazepam and met methadone can cause respiratory depression, acute respiratory depression. That's why I put it. Not necessarily cytochrome interaction, but I mean, respiratory the potentiation of two drugs. But other, other three A's. Uh, you need to be aware of just to make it simple for this long list you know, of, of these drugs. Next one. But these ones are uh, inducers where you need, need need higher dose of methadone because if methadone is metabolized rapidly and we use rifampicin anti tuberculosis drug in India commonly and the phenytoin and dexamethasone can also do that. You know, somebody on chronic dexamethasone, you need higher dose of methadone just to be aware. This, I like this situation more than the previous situation. Next one. So, uh, coming to the last case where, how do you convert when somebody's on high dose methadone to morphine? So not many studies at all on this subject because usually you don't have to do this, uh, fortunately, because the, 
Methadone is a high potency opioid, but it, methadone is an opioid. It also has other effects on NMDA, serotonin, on epinephrine receptor uh, uptake. It does cause problems too. Side effects, the same same side effects. When that happens, then time to switch to other opioid. And uh, opioid we have is morphine. So, so this is a case: 50, 54 year old female with ovarian cancer on methadone. Uh, uh, I can't see the dose here, but she has abdominal pain. Part to emergency room with myoclonus, delirium, hallucination, same side effects like morphine. What will be the next step? So next one, please. Based on uh, Paul Walker, my colleague here, who did a retrospective analysis on 29 patients, we found the ratio to go from pure methadone to morphine and one to four. If somebody is needing uh, 10 milligrams of uh, methadone, they need 40 to 50 milligrams of morphine. But IV methadone, since it's not available in India, but I put anyway, IV to PO methadone, the ratio was different. So you need a higher dose of water. So based on a very, uh, very two series of studies, okay. So this is again, I, I borrowed from uh, Professor Harvey from Australia. I, I like this slide because it's a Cochrane review done in 2007. So they uh, updated, looked into nine randomized control trials in, in, in 400 plus patients. Methadone versus other opioid uh, comparisons. So they used everything. They, they found out that there's no superiority of methadone over morphine, like some of us claim. No benefit in neuropathic pain. No true studies, like reaching level on evidence. Then high rate of withdrawals uh, from adverse effects over 21 days. Having said that, next slide, please. Having said that, the Cochrane again updated in 2017, in February they updated this and that's still the same thing, uh, no no difference in their opinion. Not much literature has been had since then. And in fact, they downgraded two previous studies, the same same uh, conclusions. But, but having said that, next one. What's the advantage? You know, uh, high bioavailability, so you don't have to really absorb well rapid onset of analgesia, it start working in half hour, really, very, very good. That's a long half life, so you don't have to dose it uh, every four hours. You can dose it actually every day or every 12 hours. This is important, lack of active metabolites. Unlike other opioids, this is the only opioid which can safely be used in renal failure situation. So that's the advantage. Then probably low tolerance, uh, because it acts on NMDA, and definitely, here in Western countries, low cost. Uh, again, at high high dose of morphine, it definitely saves money in India as well. And we'll see how it uh, shapes up. Safe in renal failure, again, cheap. Um, it is beneficial in difficult pain scenarios. Uh, we have seen that, all of us have seen, it works like magic. When you convert from high dose morphine to methadone, in many, many women cases where like, you know, shock, like how, how good the patient feels the next day in a few days. Next one. First line in rare situations, this is what I'm, uh, I'm telling India. The first line methadone, I would not recommend that and I would be cautious. It's used mostly in combination pain syndromes from, from papers and a lot of experience, even though it's not level one. For example, in cervical cancer is common with the pelvic tumor and lumbosacral plexopathy. Very common scenario in India. Head and neck cancer, the compression on the branches of trigeminal nerve, very common. So these are all combination things, somatic and neuropathic. Probably a very good situation uh, once you have tried morphine, tramadol, and other opioids. And it's a very good one to convert to. The neuropathic uh, pain states, refractory to other adjoints and combination of NSAID adjoints and opioids, they are refractory. Possibly not a bad idea to try methadone. And definitely in people, uh, patients with renal failure. This is so such a common scenario, right? In cervical cancer, where they have obstructive neuropathy and they have uremia and creatinine high, and morphine is already causing a lot of twitching and hallucinations and restlessness, delirium. Excellent scenario <coughs> to convert to methadone. And then the cost, we can discuss that later. But I think cost is not prohibitively expensive. It's slightly more than morphine looks like, or maybe comparable at high doses. So these are all the indications for use of methadone in India. Caution, definitely. In the HIV patients on antiretroviral therapy, you would calculate the dose, but cut further, uh, further 30%. So basically, you're using only 40% of the calculated dose. Because you cut 30% for incomplete cross-tolerance, another 30, 
because there are other medications. So be careful. And then we casually use midazolam. I've seen again. Uh, sorry for the selling of midazolam, uh, but we be careful. I've seen midazolam used as a syrup in India for anxiety, pain, and all that loosely. So we need to be careful when you're using methadone and midazolam and diazepam and uh, things like that. And uh, be aware of uh, if there are anti-tuberculous drugs, the pain syndrome, and they already have the fantasy. So you probably need a higher dose of methadone. Uh, and now I have this scenario. Than the previous scenarios. And then be careful in patients who are taking antipsychotics, including ondansetron, also uh, known to cause EK, EKG prolongation. So, what seem like a, a benign drugs uh, may become problematic when used with methadone. So, drug interactions should be you should be aware of. So, in the bottom line, it's coming to uh, just to conclude on what methadone is. Bottom line, it's coming to. Uh, so, it's a it's a safe analgesic. Very good medication to rotate to if you have a problem with morphine and other opioids, but be aware of drug interactions. But very, very useful. It works like magic. It almost works like a, but we have, um, some of us are anesthesiologists. We, have, we are used to seeing like magic response to celiac blocks and some of the procedures we do. It's almost like that. You know, sometimes better. They, they, it, it works like magic in some patients. So, so use it. Use it with caution and get some bedside experience and then proceed. And I would advocate uh, at, at least collect data on the first initial 100 to 200 patients and, and publish it and see the Indian experience. It's very, you should not miss this opportunity because you're starting methadone. So all the multi centers should collect the data and then publish together. Okay, next one, please. So and we already talked about this. Uh, be aware of drug interactions and if you analyze the conversion, conversion uh, weight, how to convert with a safety valve in place and all that. And next one, this is the uh, you know some of the references uh, that I gathered. There are new uh, papers again I didn't include like uh, Navin was uh, mentioning. Uh, we can send you those. Uh, next one, please. So these are these are all the references. Again, this is not by any means complete list. But we can tell you a complete list with papers also. Thank you. Thank you so much for your attention, and we can have more questions if you wish. Ready, I have a question. Yeah. Um, in uh, when you mentioned about the drug interaction, so when you require to use haloperidol and midaz in um, difficult cases of delirium and towards end of life, etc., as infusion, continuous infusion, and your patient has always been on methadone, yeah. um, well, how do you manage? Do you convert them to morphine? No, I, I would reduce the dose by 30%, 30 to 50%, but 30% for sure. Then you start them on these medications and observe, of course. Yeah, that's what we do. Dr. John, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, I, I really appreciated Dr. Reddy's uh, thoughts about uh, the experience at MD Anderson and how soon they make dosage adjustments. Uh, it, the, the fact that in his, his clinic, as in my clinic at the University of Minnesota, uh, we have highly trained nurses who are calling patients at home every day and asking, uh, it, how is this patient doing, uh, et cetera. You know, there, there's always the intersection of, of both the science and the practical aspects uh, of, of providing care for patients. One of the things that I wonder about in the India setting is the, the resources for being able to um, very accurately assess the patient's experience at home. And I, I also think back to my own experience when I first started prescribing methadone. I said, well, I have good training. I don't want to be afraid of it. At the same time, I want to be cautious with it. So I think each 
team in India will, will have to make thoughtful decisions about how quickly they do any dosage adjustments. You may or may not have the ability to, to very uh, uh, accurately assess the patients at home. If, you, if there aren't the resources for very accurate assessment at home, like Dr. Reddy and I have here, you, it, teams may decide to, to be on the five-day side or the seven-day side for adjustments. Um, I think each team will have to decide that. I, I hope I'm saying that clearly, uh, the, that, uh, that dosage adjustment time interval is a really important thing. People in, in uh, India are gonna be assessing, hey, are, they, what are, are these palliative care docs doing a good job uh, and, and avoiding problems as they make these, these adjustments? So it, it is a difficult thing to do. We, we hear about time frames anywhere from three days with good evidence, as Dr. Reddy uh, presented, versus uh, longer intervals, uh, et cetera. I hope I'm saying that clearly, but don't be afraid to come to your own conclusions about the, this three to five to seven days versus when you make dosage adjustments. I, am I saying this clearly? Sure, sure. Thank you. I have a question, Dr. Reddy. Good morning. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yeah. So when you talked about converting, this is Mona Gupta. When you talked about converting from methadone to morphine, um, you gave us different ratios whether methadone is IV or PO. Right. But you also stated that IV to PO conversion of methadone is one is to one. So why is the difference in conversion from methadone to morphine? Uh, okay. I tell you what. IV? This is these are our group, okay? and uh, all the twenty nine patients were valuable. I think uh, our faculty has been very cautious in converting IV to factor two, multiplied by two. And, uh, I don't think any of the 29 patients are mine because I really don't do it. So that's the reason, you know. If, uh, if, if they did one to one, I'm, I'm pretty sure they had a fine different ratio. But I think I have a feeling, I mean, we, we debated that. I think then we come to the conclusion that probably they use one to two ratio. And that's what I want uh, here at clinic, what we have done in the past. When you change from yeah. IV to PO, yeah. we do uh, one is to two. Yeah. For a, but when we do from PO to IV, we do one is to one for a safety factor. Mm. So the, I mean, next time, try one to one for both. Yes, so yes. Good. Yeah, I'm sure <laughs> it'll even be more conservative. Yeah. It's a great question, though. Thank you, Dr. Mona. Um, if, uh, are there any questions from the centers in India? Because I know that we have overshot our time. Um, uh, I'm not able to see all the participants because you know my screen is full, but there are many more screens which I'm missing. There is one to Dr. Gayatri Palak. Your experience okay. with obstruction and pain. What's that? Your experience with obstruction and pain. Experience in bowel obstruction and pain? Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, that's the problem. I think if somebody has got bowel obstruction, not able to take by mouth, methadone probably is not a great product. You can, you can use something poorly. And we have used it subcutaneously also if you have the preparation available. Same I will use subcutaneous, uh, but subcutaneous cause irritation. And but you know, there are some groups use it, I use it. Sublingually, not satisfactory, but it's better than morphine because it's lipophilic. So you can do that. But really it's not very good for small bowel obstruction. Uh, so absorption may be variable. And some people in even in small bowel obstruction, they use it. You know, hoping that something will be absorbed, but uh, absorption can be variable. So it's all uh, it all depends on you know uh, what else you have available. And if you don't have anything else, then the people start using something. Else. And orally liquid in a liquid form also. So people with small small ball of such, sometimes they have a, a tube, you know, a venting tube. What we do is we give liquid methadone or tablet methadone also, and clamp the tube for about half hour or so, 
the as long as they can tolerate, and then release it when once they are feeling nauseous. If they can tolerate clamping the tube at least for 30 to 40 minutes, you can still try giving method on my mouth. That that's what we will do. Okay. So yes, it's a it's a tricky situation, not an ideal drug, but if somebody is already on it and developing small bowel obstruction, then you have to devise ways to do it. And also remember, methadone as a suppository is excellent. You know, Chairman Nehru Prover has done that. Put methadone in suppositories and use it rectally and absorb beautifully. Nice absorption. And uh, you know, there's good evidence that it works equally well in suppository wise. So you can also use in suppository form. So don't forget that that route. Sometimes that route is available. Dr. Naveen, I see you unmuted. Do you want to add something? <laughs> I think uh, Dr. Reddy has covered uh, most of the things. Uh, maybe in my next presentation, when I'm talking very specific to India, I will highlight some of the barriers or the challenges that what we may face One while minute. using methadone in the Indian sector. Yeah, I think that, uh, it, it should come from you, for sure. <laughs> barriers and all, yeah. I think uh, we had a great session and uh, we learned a lot, Dr. Reddy, thank you, including the fact that, you know, we can stand uh, in front of the computer and work <laughs> and be involved in work and, you know, stay healthy. Yeah. So let's uh, keep some of our questions for the, there are two more sessions. Next is Dr. Naveen's. Please be here to attend it. So thank you for joining in and uh, we'll meet you again. Dr. Sunil, any announcement for uh, the next session? Uh, next session is on 21st of this month. So, so I will and he'll and be, he'll be on, on scenario. scenario. Uh, we couldn't hear you. Um, it was broken. Um, can you just repeat it? Next session is on 21st of this month by Dr. Navi, and he will be speaking on case uh, scenarios based on Indian palliative care. So I request all of you to please attend. And thank you, uh, Dr. Rishadi, for the wonderful session. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was a pleasure. And don't forget to say hello to Biju. I saw behind you, right behind you. So it's been a while I didn't meet him, but uh, hello to, of course, hello to everybody. Uh, I just saw Biju and Niti Sipek. Just say hello to him, OK? Hello to Rakhapar and everybody. Everybody in India, Niti Vidya, Vishwanath. Thank you so much, and everybody really. I know most of you. It has been a pleasure, and we'll 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 meet again sometime. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Have a great day, Dr. Reddy.